I wanted to talk about what TC39 is doing and how you can help us, because as, as Maggie was saying, we actually need your help in figuring some of these things out. So yeah, I'm Daniel Ehrenberg, or Little Dan on the internet. Uh, I live outside of Barcelona, and I work for Egalia, which is a, a consultancy that works on free software, a lot of web browser uh, work, like embedded browsers and uh, new CSS and JavaScript features. And I mostly work on TC39. So uh, to recap the, the TC39 stages, uh, we have stage one. We're talking about an idea uh, in the committee openly uh, and with the, with the community, uh, but we haven't really decided much of anything. Uh, at stage two, we decided we're, we're going ahead with this. We want to do this feature, and we have a first draft. At stage three, uh, we, have a, we have a pretty final draft. We've talked through all the semantics. And we've really done all we can do before, before it's time to, to implement it. Even before stage three, there are often early prototype implementations, like polyfills or transpilers. But after stage three, the proposals are often implemented in, in uh, web browsers or Node or these sort of things with higher stability requirements. And often they, they ship because things are pretty stable at stage three. At stage four, we have two or more implementations, and we have tests, a test suite that's shared between all the JavaScript uh, engines. So it's ready to go into the standard. Wanted to talk through some uh, TC39 proposals uh, by the stages. So with these stage four proposals, they're at least in the draft specification, and they're going to go out in ES2020, assuming uh, nothing goes wrong. It's not, not clear what would go wrong. But dynamic import, uh, it's at stage four. Dynamic import lets you import a module, uh, but not with an import statement that happens up front, but with, a, with an expression. It's like using import as sort of a function so that it works with code splitting. It makes it so that you don't have to download the code that you don't use. So in this example, when you click the button, it imports the module, and then you can use that, that module. Also, I have Intel relative time format. As, as Christoph said, I have, I've been helping out with with these proposals, and I'm uh, uh, just writing down the names of the, the other people. ZB, ZB Braniecki did a great, great work on this proposal in terms of uh, assessing the need for this. There, there are all sorts of different internationalization features that you could imagine. But one that comes up pretty often is that you have a certain uh, length of time, like in five minutes or three hours ago, and you want to represent that in a way that's localized. So this works with different languages, uh, and it gives you these strings that are just commonly needed in, in user interfaces. In optional chaining, uh, there's <coughs> if, you, if you have some big sort of configuration object that may or may not have certain properties, if you use dot to access them, uh, you have this annoying thing where if something's missing, then it throws an exception, because undefined dot, uh, that's just a type error. So instead, you could use question mark dot, which only gets it if uh, you don't have null or undefined. Uh, similarly, nullish coalescing. A lot of people like to use uh, double bar or for sort of defaults. So you want to say, OK, so if this option is provided, use it. Otherwise, default to this other one. But if you use or, this is really broken. Because then if you have 0 or the empty string or something like that, then it suddenly uh, gets treated as the missing value, and you go back to that other value. So nullish coalescing, this question mark, question mark operator, just checks for null and undefined, kind of like optional chaining. These, these features are implemented in multiple uh, browsers. They're there in Babel and TypeScript, and uh, import is in, in bundlers and polyfills. Uh, so they're, you know, they're, they're standard even if they haven't, as, as far as I'm concerned, even if they haven't landed with ES2020 not having come out yet. And we have some stage three features, like weak refs. Weak refs let you refer to an object without holding it alive. So this could be useful for certain kinds of caches or observation patterns where you, you create a weak ref, and then you can call this deref method to get at it. Uh, this slide, actually, uh, almost all these slides here come from the actual proposals in TC39. So I'm trying to give you sort of a slice of what you hear about at the meetings. 
We've been spending a long time debating all the details to make sure that Wheatgrass work as similarly as possible between different JavaScript engines because everyone has a different garbage collector with different details and it's important that the application work the same way uh, across those. So one thing is if you call deref once, you're going to get the same result if it's in the same sort of uh, straight line of code. Also have private fields and methods. So uh, what we decided was that you have a hash at the beginning of a name of a field or method inside of a class. And what that means, see an audience member shaking their head. I know some people really don't like the hash, but uh, it's the best trade-off we could make. These things are often pretty difficult. Uh, if you really want to make sure that something can't be accessed outside the class, this gives you a way to do it. So you can think of hash as sort of the new underscore. Not for everybody. If you actually want your code to be accessed from everywhere, it's good. But if you want to make a library that you evolve the internals over time, while the interface, about while, while the interface stays the same, you might not actually want those underscore things to be part of your interface that you're maintaining compatibility over. So it's just for the cases where you want strong encapsulation. Last thing I would want is for us to become uh, like with Java conventions where you have to use getters all the time. That's not, that's not what this is about. But you know, if you have a counter where uh, you have this field underscore x, which is kind of discouraged, you can still access it. But with private with a hash, uh, you can't access it outside the class. That's at stage three. Uh, so some stage two features, we have decorators. Decorators let you extend the behavior of classes. Uh, you could decorate fields or methods or the whole class. And it's a pattern that comes up commonly across frameworks. Uh, yeah, yesterday we heard Evan use talk about how, well, you know, some frameworks aren't going with that. But in, our, uh, in this uh, framework outreach call that, that, that we have, a lot of frameworks still are. Not everybody is switching to a sort of hooks pattern. And it comes up in cases that are not frameworks as well. If you want to sort of directly implement reactivity uh, when in classes, this can be really useful. Um, so stage one features, these are sort of ideas that are under discussion among us. We have pipeline operator. So say you have a library of a few functions, and you want to call them all on a string in order. One, one way to do that would be to just have this nested function call. But somehow this feels kind of backwards. Like when you have the string, first you call double say, and then you call capitalize, and then you call exclaim. You have to read it kind of right to left. Uh, and with bigger expressions, it can become kind of unwieldy and hard to, hard to keep track of. Uh, so with the pipeline operator, you can just pipe it from one thing to the other. The thing is, without the pipeline operator, a lot of people want to use method calls for each one of these. Uh, but that doesn't compose well at all. By using functions, uh, they can just be exported from modules. One proposal I'm really excited about is records and tuples. This gives deeply immutable things that are they're kind of like arrays and objects. Tuples are the immutable arrays, and records are the immutable kind of objects. And they're, they're deeply immutable. So a lot of applications have this, uh, you know, for maybe for your state, you could JSON stringify and then JSON parse that uh, to make sure that everything is cloned. With records and tuples, you won't have to do anything like that because you just can't mutate them. You know, with object freeze, you might forget to freeze the whole structure. You might freeze just part of it. But this doesn't allow that. And uh, OPE is to, to with, with pipeline, allow these more functional programming styles that people are doing just without, uh, without the language support that might facilitate it. Um, so operator overloading. Uh, operators like plus in JavaScript, uh, you know, they just have a particular meaning, and maybe maybe that's good. Well, I'm not sure. Uh, for for number, they add numbers. For strings, they concatenate strings. And then we decided for big int that they would add big ints. Uh, but you could imagine other cases, like in Python, for example, NumPy is is very popular and has these vectors and matrices. And it seemed useful to have that kind of thing in JavaScript. Otherwise, things like TensorFlow JS have to use methods. Uh, so we just discussed this at the TC39 meeting in San Francisco uh, yesterday. I was, was calling in from here. 
and got to stage one. Uh, then there's stage zero. It's not even really a stage, I don't know. It's just uh, we're discussing it, but not like in the committee yet. So uh, big decimal. Uh, wanted to present it yesterday. It kind of fell off the agenda, discussing a lot of things. Why are numbers broken in JavaScript? We have uh, 0.1 and 0.2. It's, it's not about the plus operator being broken. It's about just the literal 0.1 can't actually be represented accurately. All we can represent is, uh, see a thumbs up from the audience, same person who is shaking his head at the uh, private fields and methods. So, uh, the, you, we can't accurately represent 0.1. Like, even though if you put 0.1 on like, the DevTools console and you print it out again, it'll get 0.1 but actually it's a binary floating point number. So it's just like one third, that would be a repeating fraction. That's what it's like for point 0.1, except it gets rounded off before it finishes. So when you do more calculations, you get more and more errors. But decimals, they come up all the time in, uh, when dealing with money or other kinds of quantities that people think about. So it seems to me like we should have support built into JavaScript. Uh, but uh, maybe more important than what we're doing exactly is, is how. I think we can only come to the right answers and the right sort of uh, strategy for how to improve JavaScript for programmers if we really have transparency and, and diversity and inclusion in how we function. Uh, and to be honest, we haven't really been great about this in the past. I mean, I don't, don't want don't to say this too strongly, but. Uh, the specification, the way we developed it, we had this big Microsoft Word document. You'd be surprised how many standards are still developed this way. What you have to do is the editor like edits the Microsoft Word document and periodically emails out new copies of it. Uh, for communication, we had these meetings. Well, we still have these meetings in person every two months, and then just a mailing list to, to talk about things, which can be good. Um, but worryingly, the community uh, the, the committee was not nearly as diverse as the population of JavaScript programmers. You know, meetings centered in uh, in the the Bay Area, as as Maggie mentioned. I don't uh, I don't know. I heard some rumor once that maybe one woman came to like one meeting before before Maggie did, but it was, uh, at least for a long time there there was there was just no gender diversity. And uh, people center around these major tech companies in the Bay Area or, or similar places. And a lot of first principles reasoning kind of pushing out what we could have gotten from practical experience. Uh, so, you know, the Microsoft Word document is rendered into this big PDF. That was our old process. Now, uh, based on great work from Brian Turlson, um, this is an HTML document that we, that we develop on GitHub. We have... Uh, we have pull requests and all the and issues and all the normal open processes that make it so that more of us can work together on it. I don't think we, we could be doing as many things as we're doing now if we had to go with the, the old model for that. Uh, we also have an invited expert policy. So as in our as in our panel, we have people from projects like like Babel and System.js and uh, Dino able to attend TC39 meetings as you know, important community stakeholders who don't necessarily work for an, an organization that would be possible to join. Um, we also have these regular calls with different uh, community stakeholders, uh, with education and with uh, frameworks and tooling authors, and we're thinking about starting more of these. Uh, and in addition to the, to the mailing list, which over the years has gotten kind of toxic, it's gotten to be a place where you can, you can send in your proposal to get it sort of torn to shreds, uh, which I'm not, not sure is the most productive. Uh, now we have a discourse instance where you can chat with TC39 members and uh, talk about early ideas before they're ready to be a proposal necessarily, or, or talk about proposals. Um, we also put in place a code of conduct. Yeah, we, it was a little bit late, but, but really great work from uh, Leo Balter and Jory Burson in making sure that we have a code of conduct that, and, and not just the code, but a, a functioning code of conduct committee to if we're, uh, something happens, there's, there's something to do about it. Um, 
and we've been improving our documentation with this. It was previously like you just had to sort of pick things up, and now we're writing more things down so that people can join. Uh, and it's great effort from Yulia Startsev for a new website, as well as uh, surveys. So one, one way to get feedback is through GitHub issues or through meetings or through calls, but also we're doing more extensive surveys, but really kind of scientific surveys that measure more than what, more than what you might expect to compare, in this case, to figure out what we should do for the pipeline operator. There were various different ideas. People were arguing. They had reasoning. It was all kind of uh, sort of in the air, but really making it concrete, giving programming puzzles and bug fixing challenges uh, gives us some more data about how to make these decisions. Uh, but the hardest part isn't, uh, I mean, building those structures, I think, is really important and really difficult. Uh, I mean, it's real work. But the hardest part is the, is the cultural change. Um, as, uh, new, as new people join TC39 and as, uh, well, also as existing, existing delegates sort of brought in their, their experience, uh, there's sort of the entrance of new values in the, in the committee about how to make decisions. Um, we might value more accessibility to newer programmers, uh, you know, working with the, the JavaScript ecosystem to, to integrate well and to provide good transition paths. Um, incremental prototyping, uh, maybe most radically, we could have practicality over, over perfection. It, it's not like we've all decided as a committee that we value this over, over that. Uh, but there are, new, there are new ideas at play in our, in our consensus process, and we're, we're still working out how to make trade-offs and how to integrate these different value systems. So it's going to be a process. Um, so I, I'd really appreciate your help here. There's a, lot, uh, there's a lot of work to do. And one way you could help is helping us refine proposals and GitHub issues. You can post comments or pull requests uh, to the specification or supporting documents. Here's temporal. Uh, we can collaborate on test to succeed conformance tests. Uh, the, the folks at Boku have been, have been really working hard at, at maintaining test 262 and creating an inviting environment for new contributors. So this is part of the promise.any proposal, fixing up some tests. Uh, it's also possible to implement uh, new proposals. So before something's at, at stage three, it probably makes most sense to implement in projects like, like Babel that are open to experimental things that are explicitly opted into, or in polyfills. Uh, and later, once something's at stage three, uh, so many different JavaScript uh, engines, I mean, all the engines that are in browsers, lots of other embedded engines, uh, and tooling are all open source and interested in contributions and mentoring uh, new, new contributors. Uh, once those implementations exist, it's really useful for, for us if people can prototype their code and uh, and give feedback and issues, especially, especially leading up to stage three. Uh, to get to stage three, I really want to have good confidence that we've, we've exposed this to the community and gotten good feedback from, from JavaScript developers. We're also working on educational materials and documentation. Uh, and we've been collaborating with MDN to provide good documentation for, for proposals. You could even join uh, ECMA and come to TC39 meetings. I hope I've made it clear that this is not a requirement to contribute. There are lots of ways to contribute, and so much of the work happens outside of meetings. Uh, but uh, this, is, this is also a really valuable path. So talk to, talk to me or one of the uh, TC39 chairs or the ECMA secretary general if you want to know more, more information. Uh, so overall, um, lots of things are coming to JavaScript, and I hope Hope, hope uh, you like them, and I hope to have your help in, in making these things better. And the stage process helps to clarify where these things are. These, these things are not all at the same amount decided. The stage four things, they're, they're in the standard. The stage one things, we're just, we're just chatting about them, and we're just trying to, at the beginning stages, thinking, figuring it out. Uh, and we're, we're working on creating a friendly and open environment. Uh, it's a, it's a work in progress, but I, I like to think that we've made some advances. Um, but, you know, let's think about what really matters. 
the climate emergency. Uh, power structures, hierarchical power structures are destroying the world. And uh, this, is, this is really important. Uh, I'd like to think, I, I, I'm not convinced that we're going to get through this just by sort of trusting that, that uh, these power structures will just sort of change their mind and stop profiting from, from this destruction. Uh, I think we need more inclusive measures for collective action. And uh, this is kind of what we're trying to do in, in TC39 and free software. We're kind of trying to build these uh, you know, consensus-seeking flat structures that I think can, can really take into account people's, people's actual needs. So you know, let's, solve, let's solve important problems together. Uh, JavaScript is fun. I don't think JavaScript is going to be the key to uh, <laughs> the climate emergency. But uh, I, I just think we should have fun with this. And uh, if you want to get upset about something, get upset about the, the climate emergency. No, no need to get upset about JavaScript. Let's, let's enjoy it. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Thank you.